Hello, welcome to the HVMFC YouTube channel. What I would like for you to do is like and subscribe. Have a blessed day. Coming up on The Inspired Word. You may have somebody come in with the right type of morals. Okay, the right thought process and the right love for people. To, you know, that's going to, when you put them kind of people in power, that's going to magnify, okay, what they have on the inside of them. See, it could be a benefit or it could be a curse. That's why it's so important that we put the right people or pick the right people to be our leaders. Village family, Pastor Charles here, with a quick reminder of our mission, which is to seek the lost, teach the found, and send the disciples. To continue to reach our community and people all around the world, I invite you to join us by financially partnering with us on our mission. To do so, go to www.harvestvillage.org slash give. Thank you. Hello, family. Welcome to Harvest Village Online. I'm Pastor Charles Miles, and I'm also met your prayer today. Go and get your Bibles, your pencil, papers, your notepads, and we get ready to get started. As you're opening up your Bibles, we're going to open them to Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, we'll be starting at verse 24 here in a moment. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. I was uh, in Santa Barbara a few weeks ago, and when I was there, I was with my wife and my, my daughter, Maya, and my, but I was with my grandson, my grandson, Charles, Charles number four. And it's something, you know, we had, we had a great time there, but as we was there, of course, we were walking around, taking in some of the sites, and we were on their main street going down and looking at some of the stores. But, you know, Charles, uh, Charles has got a lot of energy, and, you know, of course, he's a little boy, six years old. But with all this energy, a lot of times what Charles does, he keeps getting in front of me. What I simply mean, he's walking in front of me, and sometimes he's about three or four feet in front of me, and I'm thinking to myself, Charles, why do you keep getting in front of me? Do you know where you're going? And so I finally asked him, I said, Charles, do you know where you're going? He says, No. I said, then why are you in front of me? He says, mm hmm. I said, Charles, I want you to get behind me. Or you can walk next to me if you want to, but you, I don't want you in front of me because you don't know where you're going. And my thought process also is, you know, I don't want him to be hurt or going to the street because, you know, these kids be making fast moves and I'm just not that quick anymore, right? But I, I, it really was, I just kept noticing he keeps getting in front of me and he doesn't know where he's going. And so I finally had, had enough of it, and, and so I just kind of held on to him for the rest of the day, and I didn't think too much of it more than that. But I noticed it next week. Me, me and him again, we're, we're out in this weekend, and we're out at my daughter's soccer games. As we're out at her soccer games, we have to go to the restroom. Or rather, Charles does, and know, he takes the restroom. And so I said, come on, Charles, go to the ba uh, bathroom. And so as he, he, once again, he gets out in front of me, and I finally I had, had enough of it this time. I said, you know, so I let him just start walking. As he kept walking, he wouldn't walk in nowhere near the restrooms. As a matter of fact, he started walking away from the restrooms. I, I knew he was safe. I didn't have to worry about cars or anything of this nature. So I just kind of let him walk. And I actually started walking towards the restroom. He finally looked back. He said, Papa, where are you going? I said, I'm going towards the restrooms. And I said, why did you start to go in front of me if you didn't know where the restrooms were? He says, I don't know. I said, Charles, I said, you keep doing the same thing over and over and, I, and it finally hit me, and I just told him this out loud. I said, son, one day you're going to be an excellent leader, but I want you to learn how to follow first. You keep getting in front of yourself, and you don't know where you're going. Okay, if you stand right beside me or behind me, I will take you to the restroom, right? And, and then it dawned on me, how many times do we do this in our own life? You know, this was a lesson for him, or it could have been a small lesson once he's six years old, but it was a greater lesson for me. And it was the Lord reminding me, Charles, don't get ahead of yourself. Okay, I'm taking you to a certain place. It's going to be at a certain time, but it's going to be at a place at a time in which I have allotted for you, what I have put in place for you. You keep trying to get out in front of me. The problem that you're having is you're frustrated. Okay, you get frustrated because you're not in a place and position that you want to be in, but remember who's leading. I'm leading you. And the Lord, it just, it just encompassed me with that understanding. And it was over two weeks that I got this understanding. And I said that because it literally started the week before, but it wasn't until the following week that I got the gist of the information that was coming to me. 
And then I, I, I went to scripture and I started looking it up because I realized the Lord was trying to get this down on the inside of me because I've been frustrated. And the reason I've been frustrated because I'm not in a place in the position where I want to be right now. So I guess what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do the things to step out, I'm trying to do the things to, to progress me and my family. And this is something I want you guys to understand because I've made the choice to make the Lord my leader. Okay, I, I, he's my savior, he's my master, but if he's going to be my master, he must be out in front and I must follow his lead. And so because I've done so, i got to be so careful of st stepping in front of him and doing my own thing, even trying to make my own path. Now that may sound odd to some people, but I want you to go, guys, real quick to go to scripture. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 is where we're going to start. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And I start to really focus on the scripture. You know, it is such a great scripture because Jesus is laying it out right now. For you who call yourself Christians, I am your true leader. I am your master, okay? You are following the path in which I'm laying out for you. Or you should be. Because some of us, what we tend to do, like say, we, we, we say we give our life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but we, we don't let him actually lead our lives. We do our best to make sure we lead our lives in the way and the direction in which we want to go. Now, some of us are maybe very successful in this. When I say successful, see, this is where that scripture comes in right now in verse 26. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Simply meaning, if God's the one that puts you on the path, okay, but yet you're having success on another path, you're probably not doing the will of the Lord. Okay, you can have success in many things. Even the devil can give you success in this lifetime. You must remember the devil can bless you. It's not the blessing of God, it's his blessing, but the devil has a way of blessing you, and it looks like the Lord is blessing you. What I simply mean, sometimes, you know, you can be doing things on your own, okay, and it has nothing to do with God, and you may be seeing the gifts of this world. And sometimes the gifts of this world, okay, if it's given by the wrong person, all things that, you know, all money ain't good money, so to speak, right? And I want you guys to understand that because some of us are having success in this world, but we are not having any success with God. And that's what that scripture really covers to me. He says, because we know what does it benefit you if you gain everything in this world, but it, it does nothing for your soul. You know, your soul itself is lost because it doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. It, it doesn't belong, you know, you know, to him. And because it doesn't belong to him, you're losing. You just don't understand it because you feel like you're winning here or you think you're winning here. Guys, sometimes folks are winning here in this world, but they're losing in the kingdom of God. They have no God, they have no salvation, they have nothing at all, but they're winning here. So the, for me as a Christian, my goal is to what to allow God to lead and win only through him. Because if I'm, I'm allowing God to lead in my life, remember, I make the choice. I make the choice whether to follow God or not. And because I make that choice, I have to allow God to lead. Right? God's not going to overpower my will. He's not going to overpower anybody's will. We have to choose for him because we choose for him to be Lord and Savior. Right? That means we're following. And we're following and doing the things he asks us to do. And let him guide us to the wins that he wants us to have. Let him guide us to fulfill the purpose, okay, and the calling on our lives. So that's where that comes into place. Now, today what I want to simply talk about, to become a great leader, you must become a great follower first. We're not talking about doing this the world's way. We're talking about doing this God's way. I want to make sure I say that. Because we have leaders in this world, they've never learned to follow. As a matter of fact, they don't know how to treat people. They don't know how to serve people. They don't know how to deal with people. As a matter of fact, they, they, they treat people indifferently just because of the things that they may have. And that's unfortunate. Okay, but a truly, a, a godly leader, you know, has humility. A godly leader, a, go, a godly leader, okay, knows what it is to be obedient. Okay, a godly leader knows what it is to be patient. A godly leader knows what it is to be taught by others. Because a godly leader, truthfully, has learned how to follow first. I want to pick up here and look at a couple leaders. And I, I really want to start with Jesus, but it's almost unfair to start with Jesus. And the reason I'm saying this is because Jesus is perfect. Okay, he never sinned, he never fell short, he never done anything wrong. And a lot of times when we look at Jesus, remember, Jesus is our example. So yes, we should always be following Jesus, but because we fall so short of our Lord and Savior, what, what I like to teach on in this area right here is I like to look at some of our leaders the ones who have failed, because we, we, we've leaders, we are leaders now that say we, we, we've fallen short. We've made some mistakes. You know, we, we've done some things we should not have done, right? But how do we, how do we pick ourselves up? 
Okay, how, how do we move forward? You know, and how do we, you know, continue to trust the Lord and follow him? So, yes, Jesus, guys, is a perfect example. And that's the beauty of this right here. So if we're studying the life of Jesus, we're going to find a perfect example of how to lead. So don't forsake studying the life of Jesus because Jesus was perfect in each and every way. But what I'm saying to you right now, because sometimes we can relate to folks who have done some of the things that we have done. Sometimes we can relate to folks a little bit better, folks who have had failures or been through experiences similar to ours. And that's simply all I'm talking about right now. But I want to look at one leader in particular. Okay, and this leader was Saul. And it's not that Saul, you know, was, was a great leader. But Saul was made king. He was made king by God. But I wanted you to see, guys, in Scripture how, how Saul, you know, he followed God por uh, partially. But because he followed God partially, he wasn't obedient exactly to the things that God said. And because of this, God replaced him. Okay, God did not, not allow him to continue to be king. Now, I'm giving you this, this thought process, guys, because, see, if we're following, we must follow. That simply means if a person takes the right step, I take that same right step. Okay, if a person takes that left, I take that same left. Okay, if God has given us some outline in his word that we need to do as Christians, okay, to follow him, we do that exact same thing. Okay, we don't look to the left, we don't look to the right, but we keep focused on him. And the reason it's so important that we don't look to the left and to the right is simply because, see, to the left we may see things working, we may see other leaders doing things, right? And to the right it may be a good thing over here, but the reason we stay focused on God because, see, what God is setting us up is for true success. A lot of times what people do, right, they get out in front of God. Just like I was telling you about my little grandson. He's, he's getting out in front of me. He has the best of intentions. I'm sure he does. Once again, he's a little, you know, bright-eyed, smiley-faced little boy, laughing and joking. That's the beauty of who he is. But he's getting out in front, okay, of the person who knows where they need to go or where he needs to go, right? But because he's out in front of me, what's happening right now is he's going in the direction he should not go. He's going in a direction that's not even benefiting him. He just doesn't know it yet. And this happens to a lot of us. We get out, we're, we're, we're moving in directions, you know, we, we think we're moving and shaking, so to speak, in the direction that God would have us to go. But we're not, in no way, shape, or form, following what God would have us to do. We're not in no way, shape, or form, okay, on the path that God has us on. And because of that, we're actually losing time, but we just don't know it yet. We just don't know it yet. Sometimes we may have even small successes, and we got to be so careful about having some of these small successes. And it's difficult because even though I'm teaching you guys about the training, most of the time when we have success, we don't necessarily look at it as a small or look at it as, as, as wrong because we're only seeing the success. And when we only see the success, sometimes what that leads us is to a thinking thought process that we're going down the right path. And this is exactly how a lot of times that we're fooled by Satan and his dominion. Okay, we're, we're tricked or, or we let astray. We just don't know it until the, the drop comes or and, until something happens and we realize, man, we were on the right path. Then that failure comes, that big loss comes, and we're trying to figure out what happened. You know, you know, God, why did you do this? God didn't do it at all. You know, people ruin their lives by their own actions, and then they blame God. That's actually scripture, and we need to understand that because if we get out in front of God, it's not God's fault. There's a, before I even get into this story with Saul, it, this is the old thing I learned some years ago. You know, you have a captain of the ship, okay, and, and the captain of the ship, you know, most people think the captain is the person who steers the ship. Actually, it's the helmsman. The helmsman is the one, okay, especially when you get the big ships with many men. I want to make sure I say that because too many times now we see captains, you know, on TV steering ships, but in the old days it wasn't like that. The helmsman is the person that had his hand on the wheel, so to speak. The helmsman is the person that's turning the ship, you know, guiding the ship and things of that nature. The captain is the one that's giving orders, and what we tend to have is it's too many folks that think they're captains in this Christian life. No, the captain is Jesus Christ. Okay, we are the helmsmen. We're doing what the captain is telling us to do. Okay, anytime we, we, we forsake or stop doing what the captain tells us to do, that's when we become our own captain. That's when we become the person that's steering our own ship. No. Okay, we are listening to the captain. We are listening to Jesus, and we are being the helmsman because we're doing what he asks us to do. So Jesus said, lay down, if you lay down your life and follow me, if you lay down the things that you want to do and follow me, then I'm going to put you on the right path. But you must lay that down. You must lay down that thought process. You must lay down those things you may have on the inside of you to do what I ask you to do. Because then if you are truly for me, or you show you are truly for me when you do what I ask you to do and forsake those things. So that's what it simply means. You must lay down your cross, okay, and pick up his. Amen? Amen. So here it is in 1 Samuel. 
Samuel was a king that was chosen to be in place by God. You know, and I, and I think about this because Samuel was starting to do some wonderful works for God. He was. But it came to a place now that Samuel had won some battles. Samuel was doing some good things. But Samuel put himself in a position, okay, where he was pressed by the people. And the people's opinion of Samuel became more than God's command of Samuel. What I simply mean by that, Samuel's weighed the people's opinion. Okay, King Samuel weighed the people's opinion more greater than he weighed what God told him to do. Now, this is important. Because a lot of time, what happens with leaders, okay, who have refused to follow or have chosen not to follow, okay, and do things the right way, they weigh people's opinions more than they weigh the opinion of God. Once again, I'm talking about biblical leadership right here. Okay, I'm not talking about the world's type of leadership. Because the world's type of leadership, they're always going to weigh what others think. They're always either going to weigh totally what they think. They're not, they're not bringing God into this right here. They're not even looking for God's correction or God's leadership. They're not looking for, you know, looking at God at all in this scenario. But the reason I'm bringing this up because I want you to understand, if you weigh what people say more than you weigh what God say, you're going to always be led astray. If you weigh what people say, okay, more than what God says to you or more than what God's word speaks to you, you're going to always be led astray. So here we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we'll pick up here in verse 18. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote to destruction of the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Now, what this says right here, Samuel was reminding King Saul what God had told him to do. Okay, but King Saul decided on his own, he's going to do what he wants to do, not what God told him to do. And what I simply mean by this, he's going to do something with close to what God told him to do, but not quite at all what he told him to do. Then verse 19 picks up, it says, why did you, did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on a mission in which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, Agag the king of Amalekite, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gibeah. Now, isn't this something? The Lord knows this is not true. Okay, he, the Lord knows he put King Saul in charge. As a matter of fact, King Saul was in charge of his people. But he allowed the people to do a certain thing. Why? Because he wanted to stay popular amongst them. Okay, this is a thought process behind this right here. Now, I'm giving you this right here because, see, this is a normal thing. This is a normal thing for any, any leader to, to want to, you know, to be successful in front of his people or to be loved by his people, right? And so he likes to get his people opinion. But isn't this something? When you truly think about this right here, it is something because even with all that being said, God must be first. Okay, especially to a true leader, a biblical leader, God must be first because the people will sway you to do things that you should not do. The people will even sway you to do things God never told you to do. Now, this is so important because this is exactly what's happening because Samuel already told him, okay, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Okay, the Lord told you not to take anything but burn everything, you know, kill everything, get rid of everything. Why? Because the Lord has already pronounced judgment upon these people and their things. He wanted everything destroyed. But Saul, once again, as king, he took it upon himself to let it be as the people wanted it. Okay, and he didn't say anything about it. So that's why he's in trouble. In verse 22, it picks up and says, As Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than a fat of rams. Isn't this something? See, because King Saul refused to follow God, because King Saul refused to follow and listen to what God asked him to do, God removed him from his position. And to me, it, it, it was almost, it, it was, to me, it was, it was harsh because to me, in my thought process at first, I was thinking, you know, I see what King Saul was trying to do, and it didn't seem bad, but he didn't listen. He didn't listen fully, and to not listen fully is still to disobey. And, and, I, and I had to get that right on the inside of me. When we don't listen fully to what God asks us to do, we actually are in disobedience. It's like a partial truth, right? There is actually no such thing as a partial truth. It's either the entire truth, the whole truth, or it's not the truth at all. But people say, well, you, you, yes, can you lie by omission? Absolutely, because the whole truth is not there. If you knew it, okay, and you didn't speak on it, and you didn't say what was the full truth, then it's a lie. Okay, it's, it's the wrong thing here. And this is exactly what, what King, is, King Saul is caught up in, okay? He didn't do everything he was supposed to do by the Lord's direction. 
And now he's being removed because of this. Now, I'm giving you guys this right here because a lot of times in our lives, okay, what tends to happen, we got to be so careful of pandering to, to, to the public, so to speak, or pandering to the people that are following us, right? we we got to follow God's word. We, we, just, we simply have to. Now, moving on past that, we must understand obedience to God is paramount because obedience is how we show we truly love God, right? And we also, let me pick up in this one scripture because this is good. This is really good right here. And i got to find it here. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. It says, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So even King Saul, out of his own mouth, knew what he did wrong. In, in verse 20, the verse right before that, verse uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, this is when the Lord rejected King Saul. And I'll read this real quick. It says, For rebellion is a sin of divination. And presumption is in iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. I'm read that also in the New Living Translation. 1 Samuel 15, 23, New Living Translation says, Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has also rejected you as king. You must understand, following is paramount for us to be true leaders. For us to be true leaders, the Lord can only take us in a direction in which he wants us to go when we truly are interested in following him. Okay, and to follow him is going to require our full attention, our whole heart to do what he, what he asks us to do. It's going to take everything most times because a lot of times we want to give into other things. We want to even give into a lot of times to our own thought process in the way that we're thinking. But God says, follow me no matter what. You know, I remember um, this is me playing ball. And uh, we, we used to have this wonderful thing amongst our leaders, especially uh, I think when I was getting a little older. And the leaders come out from the team, and I'll never forget it because they, they have this, 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 this statement, you know, every day, you know, you got to show up with your whole heart, show up with your whole heart, to practice show up with your whole heart before you go out and play that game. And we knew that, especially uh, even when I was in college, I especially knew, especially when we were really good, we were ranked high in the nation, but we knew every game that we were going on that field to play. That, that that our opposition, the the team that was coming against us, they won't give us everything we they got. Why? Because there's nothing like not knocking off a, a top rated team. Nothing like it, right? We we've been in positions like that. We've won games like that, and there's nothing like it. But now when we're in the top of our game, we're we're very high ranked. That's the first thing people want to do. They will come in and give it they everything. Why? Because they ain't got nothing to lose. They ain't got nothing to lose. So they coming after you with everything they got. Why? Because they want to knock you off. And so we knew it was going to take our whole heart, everything on the inside of us. Every day we took that field, it spent everything for us to go out and win that game. Everything. But when I think about how Satan comes against us, see, Satan already knows he lost the fight. He already knows that in the end it's already over him. It's already been predetermined, okay, what's going to happen to him. So he knows that. So because he knows, you know, he's that underdog already. He's going to stay that underdog because he's already, the loss has already been predetermined. He's coming after us with everything he has, every trick, every deception, everything he's got. He's throwing it after us. You know, he's going to make sure he does whatever it is to take us out. And we got to be, the reason we need to be aware of that because a lot of time he acts through people. That's who he acts through. He acts through people. Okay, he uses people to deter us. I see a lot of our leadership today within our in our country. You know, our, our, you know, we don't. I, I hate to say this, but I feel like our, our best leaders are no longer present. And the reason I'm saying this right here because our leaders they they pander totally to the people. And when I and, and, and saying that, you know, you get you got people with all these these these, these bad thought processes. People have to do these bad things. I mean, I, I can't believe. Now, some of our leaders pander to people that just have an evil heart. Okay, they don't care about people at all. People are just uh, all kind of racism, all kind of, you know, don't, don't care about homeless people. I mean, just, yeah, you, I can't even, uh, just, I can't call it. It's, it's just so terrible everywhere. But they pander to these, these folks. We don't have, I can't tell you right now, and I don't want to put this over everybody, but it's so hard for me to see a biblically-based leader, an actual leader, Okay, that the one that's obedient to the word of God, the, the one that shows humility, the one, you know, that's patient in this thought process. And I say patient because, you know, you've you got to have a leader that's willing to, to wait on God, willing, willing to hear from God. You know, you have to also have a leader that's willing to be taught by others. Okay, they, 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 you know, our leaders these days, man, I don't, I don't see any of that. I just don't. 
You know, our, our leaders, man, we got folks right now in charge in this world, and unfortunately, we do know the world, the, the way in which the world, world is going, okay, which is actually downward, not upward. But because of this, it's hard for us to follow our leaders. And I'm not trying to speak evil of our leaders. It's just look at what you see. Truly look at what you see. I, I feel like I'm in a place in a position we're getting ready to have our presidential elections coming up here pretty pretty soon. But when I was a young man, used to, the thought process would be, you know, which one of the two, you know, uh, the, of the, these great leaders we're going to get ready to choose from? You know, who's going to be the best? I don't feel like we're in a situation like that anymore in this, in this country. You know how I feel now? I didn't got to a place in a position, you know, regarding our leaders, especially our presidential leaders. You know, which one's going to do the least harm? That's crazy. That's the position we're in. You know, I wouldn't vote for any of them, as a matter of fact. You know, that's, that's exactly the position we're in. I wouldn't choose for any of them, rather. But which one is going to do the least harm? That's the position we're in. Okay, these are not biblically-based leaders at all. And some will say, well, we don't need biblically-based leaders. Then what kind of leaders do we have? Help me understand that. You know, write in. Help me, help me, help me get it. You know, because see, biblically based leaders, you know, these are leaders that to me would choose and step up to be, to be leaders of whoever's in this country. Okay, they have morals, they have standards, they stand on principles. Okay, you, they, they don't sit there and, and, and back down on anything. They stand for something. They stand for something. And that's what takes me to where I'm even where I'm getting ready to go with King David. And the reason I bring King David up in this right here, because King David had moments. Okay, in his life, we also failed to follow the Lord. Now, we do know that King David did follow the Lord most of his life. Okay, that's the beauty of it because even God said David was a man after his own heart. That doesn't mean he didn't have any failures. That just meant, you know what, when he saw his failures, he acknowledged him. And when he, he acknowledged him, okay, he asked for forgiveness and he moved forward. I don't see leaders doing that today because there's no humility today. There's no humility in, 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 in when they fall short, when they do something wrong. I never hear any biases, you know, sit there apologizing to the people in which they lead. You know, we, we need leaders that stand for the people. There was a leader about 20, 2,300 years ago. And uh, he was considered a very great leader. You know, and the reason I'm bringing this up because this was a leader who was, he was revered because the people loved him. Because the people viewed that he was for them. And I'm talking about right now about a 20-year-old leader. He was 20 years old before he was made king. And he was made king. He, at this time, by this time, he had not lost any battles. And he was considered, you know, a, a, a king that was loved and he was feared by his enemies. And I'm talking about Alexander the Great. Now, I, I don't know about, you know, what kind of, you know, far as his religion was in this 23 years ago. And, I, and, you know, so I don't know anything about that. But I do know this one story gives us an idea of who he was. He was uh, walking through, him and his military, his army, they were walking through the Persian desert. About 30,000 men were with him as he was going on this quest. And at this time, they had gotten to a place where they hadn't had the water for some time and his soldiers were getting him. They were you know, in that position here. They needed some water very badly. And they needed a thirst quenched. And so he, he sent off a, a small group of men in, in that desert area in which he was in to go find water. And as these men were out for some time, they finally came across, I guess, a small ravine or a place where they had water. And one of the men, you know, I guess he was so excited when he found water, he, he, he got a helmet, filled his helmet up with water, and he got back quickly to where the king was. And when Alexander had saw, the, you know, saw him coming and he came in with his helmet of water, you know, he, he told the men, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, basically, you know, he praised him for bringing him back this water. But he also understood I can't take this water in because if I take this water in before my man, I'm going to, it's like I'm putting myself before I put them. And so as he praised the man and thanking him for buying his water, he didn't take that helmet and drink that water. What he did before everyone out there was he showed the helmet and then he turned the helmet upside down. Okay. And, and all the water came out. And the reason the, 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 the soldiers loved him for this, because they knew their king, their leader was for them. And he was going to be in the same place in which they were going to be in. And so if we're going to drink water, we'll all drink it together. And, and I love that because what that does, that puts our, you know, a true leader is in the same position, the same predicament he, he is with his people, even though he's in power. See, it's something when you get that true leader, because even though they have power, okay, they don't use that power to force people to do a certain thing. What they use that power is to empower others. 
Did you get me? They don't use their power to force people to do certain things. They use that power to empower others. And we see that with our Lord. We see that with God. Why? Because God will not force your will. He's not using this power to force your will. God is trying to empower you to be the best person, okay, to be the best son and daughter, to be the best Christian, to be the best servant while you're here on this earth. That's what his goal is. And see, the reason I, I like this story about Alexander the Great, you know, for whether he was a great man or not, that's, you know, that's for people to decide. I, I'm, I'm not talking about that, but I was talking about this one instance when he showed why the people loved him, why the people backed him, why the soldiers backed him. There was this, this portion I want to use or the story I want to use because see, it shows when you're in it within, when you're in the same situation, when you're going through the same hardships, okay, the people are going through, that's the people love you for it. Why? Because they know you feel their pain. So we, we don't see this within our government today. Okay, our leaders, unfortunately, they sit way ahead of us, way on top of us. Their benefits, the things that they have access to, the regular folks don't have access to. And that's probably the biggest disconnect that you can have. In no way, shape, or form is that biblical leadership. Not at all. Not at all. And I want you guys just to think about that as, as you guys go in and, and doing your selection process or going as you, you look at people. You know, we should pray on things. We have to. Because we're looking for leaders that want to be their best. We're looking for leaders that want to be led by God. Why? Because we want biblically based leaders. Why? Because we know they have the right moral standards. They're not sitting there and leading their own way. I'm not saying that just because now for folks that don't, don't live a biblically based life, okay, I understand that the way they may seem to scare you, but look where we are now. Be so careful, okay, of choosing people with not the right morals. Be so careful of that, right? Because if their morality is terrible now, you know, what it's going to be when you get in that power? What it's going to be when you get in that leadership position? The truth of the matter is, it's like money to me. Okay, money doesn't make you act better or worse. All money does, it gives you the resources to magnify what's already on the inside of you. That's to me is the same thing with leadership. Okay, when you get into a position of power, okay, what that does, it, it gives you the ability to magnify what you already have on the inside of you. So if you have hatred for others, okay, if you have imbalance, okay, if, if you have terrible morals, now you have the power in which to greatly magnify those things, right? Now you can have that same thought process, okay, you may have somebody come in with the right type of morals, okay, the right thought process and the right love for people, the, you know, that's going to, when you put them kind of people in power, that's going to magnify Okay, what they have on the inside of them. See, it could be a benefit or it could be a curse. That's why it's so important that we put the right people or pick the right people to be our leaders, whether it's, in, with, the, whether it's in, in, with our leadership within our country, leadership within our state, within our cities, whether it's leadership within our jobs, okay, our businesses, in every form of leadership. Amen? Amen, amen. Let's move forward. <clears throat> I want to pick up here just for a moment. And I'm going to pick up here about the, concerning the Israelites in the wilderness. And the reason I want to talk about this also, because here it is. You've heard me talk about this even a little bit before. Here they are. You've got a people now. Okay, being led by God personally. Okay, yes, they, they have a leader in Moses, but remember, Moses is an under-shepherd. Moses being, is being led by God. He's being led by God where God is speaking to him on a regular basis. The Israelites have a, a, with a cloud by day and a fire by night. Okay, knowing that God is leading them, but will they follow? And they got to a place where they were getting ready to enter into the promised land. Remember, from where they were, okay, when they left Egypt, okay, when they, when they crossed through the Red Sea, it was an 11-day journey to get to the promised land. And the Lord was going to try to take them straight to the promised land. Now, the problem they had is they refused to follow God. They refused to listen. Why? Because their fears kicked in. And when their fears kick in, okay, like most of us when our fears kick in, we refuse to follow and tend to lean back on our understanding on what we know. So instead of going full, you know, ahead of steam, so to speak, now, you know, our fears kick in. So whoa, 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 whoa. I can't do that. I'm not sure of that, right? But yet, the reason this is so important that I bring up because I want you to understand why God was probably so harsh on the Israelites during this time period. God had just showed the Israelites, remember, just had shown them these wonderful miracles that he did on the land of Egypt. Okay, these things he brought against Egypt because of what Egypt had done to them, and he had led them out of Egypt. So now they're in a place where they're getting ready to enter into the promised land because the Lord, the Lord is going to take them out of Egypt into the promised land. So 11-day journey, okay, remember, they were most of them walking, 11-day journey to get to where they were going to go. And so when they were going to send out spies, they actually did send out spies, okay, when the spies came back, 
most of the spies, other than Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, they came back and gave a bad report. Now, this is important. When they came back and gave the bad report, okay, unfortunately, because they listened to these leaders who went out and gave the bad report, the entire crowd was, was swayed by that report, and they started to grumble against Moses and against God. They didn't trust what God said, that they would be able to go in and take possession of the land. Now, this is important. Once again, here they are. Okay, a good leader is not swayed, okay, by others' report. A good leader is listening what to the Lord and understands he must move based on this. This is so important that we get this on the inside of us. Because if we understand that we, we are going to be, once again, good Christian leaders, we've got to be led by God and not by others because sometimes others will get you put in a place in a position where you're not moving in the right direction. The same thing happened to King Saul, if you remember back. Now, so here they are, they're listening to, you know, to the people, everybody except Caleb and Joshua. As a matter of fact, Caleb even made a statement, hey, we have more than enough to go in and do what God told us to do. Why? Because we have the Lord. That's the beautiful thing about Caleb and Joshua. Okay, they still follow God. But because the people, you know, didn't believe, they didn't trust the Lord, refused to follow what he asked them to say, the Lord punished them, guys. They're punishing them. And if you look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 14, verse 26, it says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I have heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I would do to you the very things I heard you say. You will drop dead in the wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and it's Joshua, the son of Nun. You said your children will be carried off as plunder. Well, I will bring them safely into the land, and they will enjoy what you have despised. But as for you, you will drop dead in this wilderness, and your children will be like the shepherds wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. In this way, they will pay for their faithlessness until the last of you lies dead in the wilderness. This will happen. Because they refuse to follow, because they refuse to have faith and trust in the Lord, even Lord, even though the Lord showed them all these great works that he had just did, just did, family. The Lord was angry and upset with them because he did all these wonderful things right before their eyes, even opened up the sea, which they walked upon dry land. And now you can't trust me to bring you into this land because there's people there. I absolutely just, just obliterated the people before you. I obliterated them. You left with spoil. You, you left, you, 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 you were rich when you left because I made them give to you. And all of a sudden, you're not going to trust me. You're not going to believe in me. You're not going to follow me anymore because you, your, your, your fear has gotten a hold of you. See, when you have bad leaders, this is one thing that you got to figure out right away. Bad leaders will always use fear to move you. Hear me out. Because once again, this is something I also see within this country. And I'm not talking bad, but this is a lot of times what I see within our leadership. They use fear in which to move people. Okay, that's not empowering people. When you use fear, to, you're not empowering people when you use fear. When you use fear to move people, these people are, are now put in a position, unfortunately, because they're looking at you as a leader, they're put in a position now where they're not thinking correctly. Why? Because fear doesn't allow us to think correctly. Fear doesn't allow us to see correct, correctly. When we're in a position of fear, guys, fear puts smoke and mirrors, you know, before us so we can't see or think correctly. Why? Because we're not seeing the right way. Our outlook is not that good anymore, right? Uh, you know, the way we see things is not that good anymore. Why? Because we're in fear. So our, our view is slanted at that point. It's slanted. And if we recognize that, guys, and we, we, we want to move differently, then we must understand we can't be moved by people who call themselves leaders who are trying to move us, you know, in fear. Now, that has nothing to do with empowerment. Remember, the best leaders always will empower you, never force you or try to move you and move you based on the emotion that, that they shouldn't be moving you with. Amen? Amen, amen. See, going back to this right here, I want you guys to get this. A lot of times when we found, when we, when we, when we fail to follow God correctly, what it does is it extends our time, okay, within the hardship of what you're going through. Okay, it turned 11 days into 40 years. That was a huge extension of time. Now, some of us, you know, may look at that and say, well, you know, especially you mean when I first started studying the, this, this portion of the Bible way some years ago, maybe 20 some odd years ago, when I was going through, I said, man, that was a harsh punishment. But when I got from this, what I understood with this, when God finally revealed it to me was, 
you know what, I could not bring these people in that were 20 years and older. Why? Because I didn't want the old mindset in the new place. If these people can be so easily moved, okay, okay, by a thought process, or so easily moved by failed leaders, so easily moved and not follow me, even though I've just done this great thing before them, they've seen how I work, I don't want that mindset going into the new place. The old mindset must die and stay where it is. That's why I'm going to send the young people in because the young people are not going to have that mindset. I'm going to get rid of the old generations and only bring the new generation in. Why? Because they have the mindset in which to follow me. And when time came, yes, okay, those 20-something, you know, they, they, they had to grow up also in that wilderness. But when time came, they marched and took over that promised land. Amen? And they, they gained the land the Lord gave them. Now, I know we've talked a little bit about this today, and we're probably going to touch on some more leadership Type, type things, but what I really want you guys to understand, anytime it comes to leading, we must learn to follow. The reason I gave you some of the, you know, the, the couple things regarding Jesus for us, the good thing and David following Jesus, that's where the blessing is always going to be. But we also have to recognize and learn from the failures. A lot of times we learn, we need to learn from the failures. Why? Because we want, we need to see how people failed. Okay, you know, if you're easily moved by people, if you're easily moved by anybody actually, actually outside of the, you know, God and his word, you know, you can easily be deceived and you're no longer following God and therefore you can simply be outside of God's direction. And then you're wondering why, you know, you're, you're failing, wondering why you're not in the right place. You're not, you're failing and you're not in the right place. Why? Because you're no longer following God. You're following your own heart. Okay, you gotta be so hard, be so careful there because even a lot of us, we say, well, you know, I, we know, I want to follow my heart, but you gotta remember your heart is wicked. It's deceitful. The Bible speaks about how our heart naturally is. Our heart only changes right now. And the heart I'm talking about right now is not the physical heart. I'm talking about the actual soul. The soul becomes more, more correct. The soul, the soul starts thinking the right way when it becomes more connected with God through the spirit. Now, this is so important because as the spirit, as you develop your spirit to God, the spirit does what? It starts to what? Develop your soul to be stronger. And then your actions start to change. And I'm giving this to you guys because... This is why we must continue to trust and have faith in God. And for us to follow God, we have to have faith in him. We're going to have to have faith in him. Amen? And so for us to, to bear our own cross, okay, the, you know, sorry, to, us to bear the cross that Jesus has given us, rather, okay, we have to get rid of the things that we want sometime. Sometimes, you know, it's not that God doesn't know some of our desires. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us the Lord knows our, our desires, but the desires he wants us to, to, to live with, or the desires he wants us to truly have, is the desires he wants to, that he has put on the inside of us. Because some of our desires, guys, are actually wicked. But when we start to align our lives with God and his word, our desires then change. And when our desires start to line up with God's word, guys, that's when we're going to see the fulfillment of the desires within us. We start to see those desires. Why? Because God's ready to fulfill okay, his desires on the inside of us, period. And I want you guys to get that on the inside of you. So guys, as you guys start thinking about leading, I want to make sure you, you get on the inside of you that we must learn how to follow first. If we don't learn how to follow first, guys, and follow Jesus Christ to be me more exact, what tends to happen is we easily can be led astray. We can easily go off go off and start doing the, the wrong thing. And so that, that's really what I want to put on the inside of you today. I know it's, it's only a little bit of time. To talk about this today, but I, I'm going to address it again in probably one of me and Maisha's as we get there, one of our conflicts and conversations, or we're going to address it on, on, on the podcast. So we're going to pick up, we're just starting this right here. This is kind of an overview, so we're going to revisit some more of it, and we're going to start looking at actions because I want us all to know that we're leaders. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this today, but we will. Even if you're leading yourself, you are still a leader because you must start with you because the following process, the truly, once again, learn how to lead, you must learn how to follow. That's the first step in your, in your growth and leadership is learning to follow. So yes, you are a leader, even if you're just leading you because there's going to be a time that you're leading others. King David started off the same way. Moses started off the same way. Even Jesus started off the same way. He had to lead himself first before he led others. And we're going to take that on too. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for teaching us, helping us to understand better. I thank you, mighty God, that you give us your wisdom, your understanding. Help us, mighty God, to know what to do and when to do the things that we need to do for you, mighty God. Help us to feel the purpose and the calling you have on our lives. Thank you, Father, as you continue to bless our spouses, our families, as you continue to keep us safe and secure, as you continue to watch over us, mighty God. Help us to know, mighty God, that you are our true leader. 
we follow you, Lord Jesus, as King. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being living on inside of us and reminding us what we must do. Thank you for giving us direction in which way to go. In Jesus' name we pray to say amen, amen, amen. Take care, family. I'll see you next week. Bye now. If you are the sound of my voice this morning and you want to know Jesus Christ for the very first time, Romans 10 9 simply states that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. So if that's you this morning, you want to meet Jesus for the very first time, simply declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And if that's you this morning, you now belong to the kingdom of God. That's the first step. But there's a powerful second step that you must take. Okay, it's the second step is your transformation to become a disciple of Christ. Okay, for you to transform, you have to pick up the Word of God and start reading it, start taking it in. To get with a good Bible-based church so the people, the people there can help you to become the person that you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you can't find nobody in the area in which you're in, you can always find us at harvestvillage.org. Okay, you can email us at admin at harvestvillage.org. And that should be on the bottom of your screen, admin at harvestvillage.org. Amen? Amen. For any reason, you may have stepped away from the Lord. Okay, and you're looking to come back. And 1 John 1, 9 simply says the Lord is faithful to forgive all those who ask for forgiveness. So repent. Turn away from what you're doing and turn back towards God. Ask for forgiveness. The Lord is ready to put you back in your rightful position. Amen. Also get with a good Bible-based church as they continue to help you to find the Lord okay, and walk in his truthfulness. Well, family, that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for joining me this morning. Okay, thank you for listening to the word. Thank you for studying the word. And have a blessed day, family. Thank you.